I'm Kevin Kelf with Chromaline. I've been working for Chromaline for the past 13 and a half years now as um, the TSR technical sales rep for the Midwest is where it started and because of you know, COVID and different things like that my territory has just kept expanding since I started. So now I cover pretty much the entire west portion of the U.S. So I get around, work with all my different distributors, do things like this, go to trade shows and go into shops and, and help you know, shops out, dial in these things that we'll discuss today. Uh, before I worked at Chromaline, I worked for CIFAR, the mesh manufacturer. So I was their application specialist for seven years. So I've been doing this side of it from the manufacturing end in the screen room for close to 20 years now. Uh, so I do have a little bit of background in the things that I'm talking about just so just so you know I'm not making up any of this stuff. This is all things that I've learned over the years. Uh, some of the stuff that I'll discuss today is going to be on the very basic, you know, lower level of, uh, you know, the screen making side of things. But some of the things I'm going to talk about are going to be on more on the advanced side of it as well. So um, if there's anything that I'm talking about that kind of goes over your head and you want to you want me to kind of elaborate on that uh, feel free to just throw throw out questions throughout the entire time if you've got questions you know things that have happened in your screen room problems that you've had anything that you want me to address that has been something that's been a nagging problem over the years or whatever the case is this is about you guys and what you want to learn and what you want to get out of it. You know, I'll go through all the, the slides and stuff like that, but if there's anything that anything at all over the years that you've had questions, burning desired questions, that you want me to touch on, please throw a hand up. I'm, I love questions. We'll take it in any direction. So with that, we'll get started. Like I said, some of this stuff is going to be basic. You know, what is emulsion? Emulsion is the photosensitive chemical. It can either be liquid or sheet form, but it's going to be applied to the screen with the purpose of making a stencil. So the stencil, when I talk about a stencil, that's the, the mesh and emulsion combination. That's when I'm talking about stencil. That's the entire screen combination. The three functions of the stencil finds the non-image areas, obviously that's what blocks the ink from going through the screen. Finds the image quality, the sharpness of the edges of your artwork, and it does meter the ink to a limited degree. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit more later, but for the most part, it's the mesh selection that you're choosing is how much ink is being laid down. Not that if I coat my screen three or four more times, that's going to really put down a very thick layer of ink. It does to a little bit, but most of it is going to be the screen and mesh selection that you're choosing, not necessarily how you're coating your screens. There's a couple different stencil system categories that I'll get into. There's direct systems and indirect systems. Indirect systems, I'm just going to touch on briefly at the start right here. Um, it's pretty much a dead system. There's only, um, we do have some customers in the Middle East, in Turkey, uh, some, some areas over there that are still using indirect film. But what indirect film is, is you would actually take the film, image it, wash it out, and then apply it to the screen afterwards. So it's a very sharp detail because it takes out the mesh from that process. So it's as clean and sharp as it can be, but it's not very durable. You know, it's not fully encapsulating the mesh, it's just on the bottom side. But resolution is very sharp. Uh, Chromaline, we actually in, invented indirect film 60 years ago. The patents have run out a long time ago and we don't even make it any, well, we, we do make it for a few customers, but not broadly. Direct systems is what we'll primarily be talking about. So direct systems, I talk about direct emulsion, which is the liquid emulsion that gets coated on the screen capillary film, or direct indirect, which is the combination of direct emulsion and cap capillary film together. Uh, it's really a 
poor naming system. I didn't name it, but really, you're not using indirect film. You're using a direct capillary film with direct emulsion, so it should be called direct direct, but it's not. It's called direct indirect. <laughs> so direct systems, direct emulsions. Like I said, this is the liquid emulsion that gets coated on the screen using a scoop coater. You can do it by hand. You can do it with automated equipment. However, that is, it's still that liquid emulsion that's getting coated on the screen. There's advantages and disadvantages to everything, obviously. The advantages for direct emulsion, least expensive per screen, by far. Very durable to mechanical wear. So as the squeegee is wearing across it, it's very durable because it's, entire, it's completely encapsulating the mesh from both sides. It can be very solvent resistant, can be very water resistant. That goes back to how we mix it and what we put into that particular product. Can be coated to any thickness. So I've got customers that are doing high density prints with say like our chroma blue emulsion, coating at one and 24. A super thick stencil. Uh, so you can coat it to any, any thickness that you want. Um, just, it's a longer process doing it that way, obviously, with direct emulsion versus some of the films that are out there. And it's by far the most used. So I, I would say most people are using direct emulsion these days, as far as the, the liquid emulsion. Disadvantages, it's difficult to master. If anybody in here has coated screens before, I'm assuming you've all, or a lot of you have coated screens before, most likely, most likely you've made a mess at one point or another, right? It's not the easiest, cleanest process out there. And until you get good at it, it, uh, it can be difficult to master. It can be difficult to get good at. Now, I've been coding screens for a long time. And I can still tell you that if I were to measure my screens, they're not going to all be exactly the same down to a micron from screen to screen to screen. And that's why people that are using automated equipment, automated coders, really take out a lot of those variables um, and make it a precise science so they're using automated equipment like that. Uh, some of the direct systems need to be sensitized. We'll get into some of that later. Uh, limited shelf life, you know, depending on the product, uh, can be shorter than, shorter than most. Like I said, it can be messy and it's not freeze-thaw stable. So what that means is we can't ship direct emulsion when it's freezing temperatures outside because if it freezes, it changes the properties of that emulsion and it can thicken and gel and get clumpy and you won't be able to use it. So some emulsions, after it thaws out, it will come back to a form that is usable, but still some of the characteristics do change, exposure times, viscosity, things like that. So it is not freeze-thaw stable, so we can't ship it during those freezing temperatures. Um, all of our stuff is manufactured in Duluth, Minnesota. You may have heard it gets cold in Minnesota, right? And we're almost at the, the northern border right by Canada is where our manufacturing facility is. So not a great place to manufacture things that can't freeze, right? But um, we work with, through distributors all over the country, good people like regional. So what we'll do is we'll stock up our distributors for the winter months so that um, if you are local, you can go and get it or have it shipped to you here versus us shipping from Minnesota all over the world. So we do utilize that distrib distributor network so we can get stuff out in the winter, which is beneficial. The other system, capillary film. This is the same thing as the previous direct emulsion. However, we've done the coating for you. So we've coated these into sheet forms. It can come in rolls. It can come in cut sheets, and the cut sheets can be whatever size that you need. So I've got people like, uh, like Bic. Bic uses very small sheets of capillary film that are only about two inches by three inches because they're using very small screens for printing on pens, uh, pens and Sharpies and all that stuff. So um, we can make them, cut them down to any size, and uh, yeah, so it's, it's easy that way. But it's very easy to use, uh, very excellent resolution, very clean process. I could coat a screen in here, and it would be perfect. 
and I'm not, I'm not worried about getting emulsion on the floor or anything like that. It's a very clean process, and it's very consistent. You know, I can teach you guys, show you how to do it one time. You can, I have full faith that all of you would be able to do it right after I showed you how to do it, and every single screen from that point is going to be the same thickness. Versus if you're hand coding your screens, the pressure that you use, the speed, the angle, all of those things that we'll get into, those variables are completely taken out of it because we've done the coding in an industrial process and those, those sheets are going to be within a micron of each other always. So it's always very, very consistent. So if you don't have automa automated equipment, something like this is another way to bring your screen room into a more consistent, perfect screens every single time. And capillary film can ship during the freezing temperature. So if you call regional and they say, ah, we're out of that particular emulsion, it's too cold, chrome line can't ship to us, we can always ship cat film. It doesn't make a difference. We can ship it anytime. Disadvantages, it's more expensive than the liquid emulsion per, per sheet, per screen. However, I can prove the other direction as well because of the consistency and less screen failures and things like that that it does kind of even itself out it's not as like if you just look screen versus screen it looks like it's far it, it looks like it's further apart from each other as far as the cost but because of the consistency you know and repeat, 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 repeat ability um, it does level itself out how does, it, that, how does it hold up for, like, It is less choice? durable than direct emulsion. Okay. So keep in mind, capillary film is only going to be applied to one side of the screen. And via capillary action, that sheet is going to suck into the mesh. So I'd say about 70% of that thickness of that sheet of capillary film will be absorbed into the mesh during that application process. And that's where the, the capillary action for the capillary sheets comes into play. So as that sucks into it, keep in mind, it's not completely encapsulating those threads. So with direct emulsion, coating from both sides, exposing, hardening, now it's going to be, it's going to be far more durable, direct emulsion will be far more durable just because, you know, the squeegee's got to wear through that before it even gets to the threads, where this is, it's running right out the threads. Right the Can you give me a, like a guess on how many shirts you could do using the capillary? Let's just say it's a one color. Hundreds. Easy. Easy. Hundreds, thousands probably in certain instances. It, it, that, goes back to, that goes back to the inks that you're using, the press setup. Right. There's a lot of different variables that gets thrown into that, obviously. Your proper, is it properly exposed? All those things. But um, it, is a very, it is a very durable system. It's just not as durable as the direct emulsion. It still is very durable. So, like, if you talk about like electronics printers, people that are printing, say, like, you know, you got your your phone, all the traces that are in your touch screens and stuff in your phones, these are all screen printed, and they're all using capillary film for the most part. Can you do capillary film and direct emulsion to increase the durability? Absolutely. And in the electronics industry, that's what a lot of times they do. That's what I was saying before that direct indirect method. That's exactly what that is. All right. So you would apply the capillary film, let it dry, and then come back through with a direct emulsion, one or two passes from the squeegee side, and that will actually bond with that capillary film on the bottom side. So then you get the consistency of the capillary film on the bottom as far as your EOM goes, but you get the durability of the direct emulsion in combination with it. And there's some inks that are It, it depends on the, the type of capillary film that you're using. And uh, I'll, I'll get into that a little bit more as well. But depending on which capillary film, how it's formulated, has to match up with the type of things that you're using. So primarily, there's three different types of emulsion. There's diazo emulsion, just straight diazo emulsion. And, that can come, and all of these can come in direct emulsion and capillary film. Uh, there's diazo photopolymer, more commonly known as dual cure emulsion. 
And then there's photopolymer, pure photopolymers, or SPQs, which is the one-part systems that are out there right now. With a straight diazole emulsion, that can be either very water-resistant or very solvent-resistant, but it can't be both. Depending on the ratio of the PVA to PVAC that we put into that bucket depends on if it's going to be leaning towards water resistancy or leaning towards solvent resistancy. So we have emulsion like our CP Tex, which is extremely water resistant. However, if you hit that with solvent based inks, it's going to break down very fast. And vice versa with our CP2, it's a very solvent resistant emulsion. But if you start using water based inks with it, it's going to break down very fast. So again, Use, use the type of emulsion or the, the product that matches up with the ink system that you're using. It can be affected by humidity. It's got good edge definition, mesh bridging, and it has medium, medium exposure latitude. So when I talk about exposure latitude, the, the wider that exposure latitude is, the more forgiving that product is. So the exposure latitude is, there's a proper exposure time, but if you're above that or below that, within that window, it's still properly exposed. So the wider that window, obviously, the more forgiving that product is going to be. So it's right in the middle. With diazo emulsion, it does need to be sensitized. So it comes with a little bottle of diazo. You would take that little bottle of diazo, and you would fill it with water to the shoulder, put the cap back on, shake it up so that it becomes a solution. Pour that solution into the bucket of emulsion, stir it up, and after it's been mixed, you want to let it sit for a couple hours. It's going to go through a degassing phase where nitrogen bubbles are actually formed on the inside, and that all of those bubbles are going to start to form and come off the top. If you were to coat your screens right away while that process is happening, all of those bubbles are going to form in your screen, and it will become pinholes later on. So let it sit after it's been sensitized. And after it's been sensitized, you have roughly four to six weeks to use that bucket of emulsion before it starts to lose its sensitivity. As soon as diazo touches water, it starts to age. So it starts, the clock starts ticking the second that you mix it into the emulsion. So what I like to do is right on the bucket, when you mix it, put the date that you mixed it right on the bucket, because then four weeks later, you look at that and go, Oh shoot, I've had this for a month already, I better use it up quick. So just keep that in mind as far as that shelf life goes. Probably our most common straight diazo emulsion is CP Tex. Uh, CP Tex is high in solids, it's very water resistant, uh, it's good for all mesh counts. Like I mentioned, the CP2. So dual cure emulsions. Dual cure emulsions can be resistant to water, <coughs> solvents, or both, depending how it's formulated. It can have water resistancy and solvent resistancy in the same bucket. Because you have, once again, a dual cure, you have two different curing systems in that bucket. You've got a curing system in the bucket. When you're adding the diazo to it, now you have two different curing systems that are working simultaneously. So with that being said, one of those could be more water resistant, one could be more solvent resistant, and combined together. It's not going to be as affected by humidity as, like, say, a straight diazo emulsion would be. And it has excellent edge definition. So as far as if you're doing really fine line detailed work or four color process, simulated process, very small dots, I typically will lean towards dual cures. As well as they have a very wide exposure latitude. So with that wide exposure latitude being very forgiving, if the area that you're working in isn't perfectly light safe, this is going to be more forgiving to work with as well. Same process, you have to add the diazo in, sensitize it, same, as the, same process as the straight diazo. One of the, the more common dual cure emulsions that regional cells of ours is our UDC2, high in solids. It comes in either blue dyed or it comes in clear. Uh, the clear emulsion comes with dye packs, so you can actually dye it to how dark that you want that emulsion to be. Uh, 
but most people are using the dyed version. Very wide exposure latitude, so it's a very forgiving emulsion. Photopolymers. Again, photopolymers can be resistant to water solvents or both. Um, when you're talking about a water resistant photopolymer, that's typically more of like a hybrid photopolymer. So that's more of a subcategory of the photopolymer emulsions. But that being said, it can be resistant to all of those ink systems depending on how it's formulated. Again, very good edge definition, mesh bridging. However, now with photopolymers, they have a very narrow exposure latitude because they are so fast exposing. They have, very, they have shorter exposure times. So the faster exposing that product is, the more narrow that exposure latitude is and more on tar target you need to be with your exposure times. However, there is a much longer shelf life. So if you're not going through a bucket of emulsion within that, that four to six week window after sensitizing, something like a pure photopolymer that has a two year shelf life is going to be uh, more attractive to, to your shot. This does not need to be sensitized. These are right out of the bucket. So it's a one part right out of the bucket. And that's the reason why it has that much longer shelf life. CTR uh, is one of, the, one of the emulsions here that they sell probably the most of. Uh, the CTR is high in solids, two year shelf life. It can only be used with plastic cell links only. Uh, and once again, very fast exposing. When we talk about hybrid photopolymers, the Hydro-X is one of our newer products. This is, once again, a one-part emulsion that you don't have to mix. However, this is very water resistant. Also, we had shifted the light appetite. So I'll get into spectrums and stuff like that in a little bit. But it's designed with the LED systems that are in, out there. So LED systems typically are just outside of the spectral range that emulsions are looking for. The Hydro X is shifted so it works better with LED lights. Capillary films. Again, light sensitive film that's applied to the screen using water to make your stencil. It's the highest level of consistency. Even higher consistency than automated coders with direct emulsion because the industrial coders that we use are much more precise than any of the coders that are out there that are coating directly on the mesh. And it takes that mesh and tension and everything out of it, out of the equation because we're, we're coating on you know, the, that plastic carrier sheet which is a far more consistent um, medium to coat on versus mesh. And there's less waste with, than direct emulsion. If you think about it, with direct emulsion, when you coat your screens and you wash out that scoop coater, some of that emulsion is going down the drain. So there is some waste. With this, if you only are doing a small piece, you can cut that small piece out and just use it right on there. For the textile industry, quick film is probably our, our most common capillary film. Uh, it's a pure photopolymer based capillary film, so it can only be used with plastolics only. There isn't a capillary film on earth that'll work with water based inks. It's impossible to do because you're applying it using water, so that water, if it was resistant to the water, it wouldn't actually work with using the water to suck onto the mesh. So we just can't make it. If, if we could, we'd sell a bunch of it. So the quick film comes in cut sheets 15 by 17, uh, comes in packs of 10 or 50. So if you want to dip your toes into using capillary film, a 10 sheet pack is an easy route, uh, pretty cheap way of getting into it as well. High density films is a completely different thing. It's not a, it's not a true capillary film, um, but it's, it's a much thicker film. It's actually a pre-sensitized piece of film. So it's going to be ideal for heavy ink deposits, mostly in like special effects printing, if you're doing high density prints, if you're doing lenticular, or uh, any of those special effects that are out there. 
those or even like flocking, um, those high density screens, fat film, high density film is going to be the easiest way to do it. Like I mentioned before, I've got customers that do great high density work with pure photopolymers and they code it 1 and 24, but that is a very touchy process doing it that way to get it so the emulsion's not dripping out of the mesh. You know? So those guys, there's I can think of about two guys. There's one guy in Canada and one guy in the Netherlands that are, is very good at doing that process and they do killer work. However, I wouldn't recommend doing it that way. I would recommend doing it this way. And I've actually told both those guys the same thing. Like, oh, I, I like doing the way I do it. Okay. Um, so it is very fast exposing for what it is. Excellent buildup. And it's consistent and repeatable. So our high density film is called Super Fat. Um, it's coated from a range of 100 microns all the way up to 700 microns. So 700 microns is extremely thick. I've got people that are actually printing gaskets right down to car parts. So if you're using like a 700 micron, I wouldn't be printing that on a t-shirt because it'd be like you're walking around wearing a, like a tire around your neck. I mean, it's going to be heavy and thick, but um, there are applications for it. Textile, eh, maybe, not, maybe not that 700 micron. Uh, you can do some cool looking prints with it, but is somebody really going to want to wear it? But, uh, uh, with this, you would use that direct indirect method. So where you would apply the, apply the film, and then you would back coat it with direct emulsion. That's what's actually going to adhere it to the screen. So, now that you've known all, everything there is to know about all the different types of emulsion, what are the factors for choosing the right emulsion for you and your shop? You have to factor in the types of inks that you're using, what you're printing on, artwork demands, the type of exposure system that you're using, what's the level of ink deposit, you know, how thick of an ink deposit are you looking to print, and what your environment is like, you know, do you have white light creeping in through the windows, or is it a nice, uh, a nice screen room that is light safe. Sense of requirements for water-based printing, the, that emulsion better be water resistant. And not only be water resistant, you should expose that screen as long as possible and still get those features to wash out. The longer it's exposed, the more cross-linking is taking place and the more water resistant it's going to be. So you always want to lean towards the high side of exposure whenever you're doing water-based printing. Water-based and discharge is an extremely aggressive ink system towards the stencil. CPTEX, Chromatec WR, HydroX, are all some of the ones that I would recommend. As far as exposure units go, there is a vast array of different types of exposure units out there, right? There's LED systems, metal halide, there's people that are DIYing their own exposure units, which I have no clue what type of light source that are, is in these units. So that needs to be taken into account with the type of emulsion that you're using as well. Say you have a very weak light source, you're probably going to want to use something that's faster exposing, just so you can get all the way through that stencil before light scatter starts to take over. This little chart here actually shows the different types of exposure units and the spectral output for each of those. So you can see down here, this blue range here, this is the SVQ. This is what a pure photopolymer is looking for for the light. This red is a straight diazo. This is what light, that type of emulsion is looking for. And then you can see back here, the different types of light sources. So you can see with LED, you've got a sharp peak right here but it's just outside of the range of both of those. So that's the reason why we took the HydroX emulsion and shifted that so it matches up with that, that range. You can see the sunlight covers everything. That's why if the sun is getting into your, into your screen room, it can affect your screens and it can expose your screens very fast. 
because it covers that entire range of light spectrum that the emulsion is looking for. You can see down here, there's this one, Inc this is this incandescent bulb. It's very far away from that. So it's not really putting out much UV, and it's putting it in a much different range. Actually, this is incandescent. This is fluorescent tubes. So you can see it's just outside that range. So it's a, it's a weaker source and outside of the range that emulsion is looking for. So you have to factor that into the type of product that you're using. The strain room environment that you're working in. You know, like I said before, is there white light that's getting in there? Is it really humid in there? You know, all of those factors play into it. The ideal environment that you should be working under is going to always be working under yellow UV safe lights. Those yellow UV safe lights are going to block the UV coming out of the bulbs that are in your room. I know that they make clear sleeves that say that they block UV light. They really block the wrong light spectrum once again. So even though you have those clear UV sleeves, it does block some of that UV light, but it doesn't block all of it that's affecting those screens. Your humidity, your relative humidity in that room should be between 30 and 40 percent. If you can keep it within that range, you're going to have the best case scenario. If it gets above that, and it's, you know, if you're hot and sticky, your screens are hot and sticky. And keep in mind that emulsion is hydroscopic. So what that means is it's like a sponge. If there's moisture in the air, even a screen that's fully dry, if you brought that into a humid environment, it's going to suck up all that moisture and it's going to re-wet and you're basically starting all over again to a point. And if a screen isn't fully dry, it's going to act underexposed, it's going to be weaker stencil, all the things that go along with that. Temperature should be between 60 and 80 degrees. You know, if you can work under all of those, you're going to be perfect. If you can't, then maybe you should be using an emulsion that's a little bit more forgiving, like a dual cure. You know, a dual cure can withstand a little bit more white light than a pure photopolymer can. And uh, it's, it's just going to be more forgiving for you guys. So if you can't work under that, once again, find an emulsion that matches up with your environment. And we can, you know, me and Rob, we can work with you guys and discuss this is what your situation is, this is what I recommend you should be using. Because if we could make one emulsion that worked for everybody and did everything, believe me, we would. We, we actually have like 30 or 40 different emulsions, and there's a reason why we have 30 or 40 different emulsions. Each one does something a little different. So when I see people on Facebook go, what's the best emulsion to use? And you see 20 different answers underneath that, and then you start seeing, uh, people are voting by the number of likes next to that particular product because that's what they're using. Now the person that asked the question goes, well, all these people are using this, this emulsion. It should work for me. Their environment, what they're using, is nothing like what those 20 other people probably are doing. So that's the, the worst way of determining which emulsion that you should be using for your shop. Screen making essentials, like I said, always work under yellow UV safe lights. Coat your screens in a cool, dark, dry environment. Uh, use fresh emulsion. Like I said, after that four to six weeks, if you're using a dual cure, it's going to start to lose its sensitivity. And then always use an exposure calculator to see if your exposure times have changed, if anything changes in the screener, if you change your coating sequence, if the humidity changes because of different seasons. You know, different seasons, humidity is going to fluctuate, right? So that will actually affect your exposure times as well. So I would say maybe once a month, you should be doing exposure testing just to make sure nothing has changed. Screen prep. You know, I always want to decrease your screens. I know that there are ink removers and reclaimers and stuff like that that claim that there's a degreaser in that product. When you're starting to put all of those together, you're, there's a give and a take. You know, if you're using one product for ink removal, one product for uh, emulsion removal, and then one for degreaser, each one of those steps really should be on its own, 
but I know that there are manufacturers out there that claim this thing does everything, you just use it for everything, and you're good to go. It's not necessarily the case. Uh, always, you, you're always going to want to degrease both sides of the screen. It's a mesh is a three-dimensional object, so clean both sides. Always make sure that you get all the degreaser rinsed off the screen, because if you don't get the degreaser rinsed off the screen, now that becomes a contaminant as well. And don't use household detergents as degreasers. Use degreasers that are designed for screen printing. I've seen people use Dawn dish soap, Ajax, Simple Green, all of these kind of things because they think it's, it's a good degreaser. Well, it's good at cleaning and degreasing the things it's designed to clean, not mesh. Because those things, usually you're not worried about getting it all rinsed off. So if you're using Ajax or any of that kind of stuff on your screen, does it clean it? Yeah. But it leaves kind of a residue on the mesh that you're not getting off, that you're not getting off. Well, once again, now that's a contaminant and it's going to repel the emulsion. Coating variables. You know the the edge profile is it is it more round? Is it sharper a sharper edge? Uh, the coating angle that you hold the scoop coater. The pressure that you push it up against the mesh when you're coating. The speed. Number of coats per side, obviously. Uh, coating speed, I like, to, I like to mention this. I had a customer down in Texas. They do roughly around 1,800 to 2,000 screens a day. They did not have automated coating machines. Uh, so they had a couple guys coating by hand. So you're trying to do 2,000 screens a day, right? Well, they called me and they said, there's debris, there's junk in your emulsion. You got to get down here, you go. So I flew down there. And I put, a, I put a loop on there and I looked at it and I said, there's air bubbles on these. There's, there's not junk in there, there's air bubbles. So we started going through the process and I was watching the guy coat screens. He's coating screens like he was starting a lawnmower. One. Next one. Two. <laughs> Way too fast. As you're coating that fast, you're just introducing air into the mesh as it's riding across that. So they were just putting air bubbles into it, which were turning into pinholes on the press. And wanted to point the blame somewhere else, but... I uh, pointed the blame right back at them. Coating technique tips. Always use a scoop coater that's at least three inches smaller than the inside diameter of your frame. I know that it's a very common thing that people want to use a scoop coater that goes all the way up to the frame because now there's less area for you to block out. The problem with that is on the outer edges of your mesh versus the center of your screen, it's a different uh, tension. So as you get closer to the frame, it's going to be higher tension. So if that scoop coater goes all the way out to the edge, now that two edges of the scoop coater are riding on those two high tension points on both sides of your screen, it'll leave a much thicker deposit of emulsion in the middle of your screen versus the outsides. If you bring in that probably about three inches, about an inch and a half on both sides, now when you push on the screen because of the tension, you're going to have a much more consistent coat from right to left. Always use a clean and nick-free coating trough. If you drop that thing and get a ding in it, uh, throw it away, get a new one. It's only you know, 20, 30 bucks or something like that for a new coating trough. It's just not worth it. You know, People try to use sandpaper or emery cloth or something like that to try to sand it. The problem is now when you start sanding out that little ding, now that's a different edge profile than the rest of it. So it's a little bit sharper it's impossible to get it perfect all the way across. And when we're talking about EUM and coating, we're talking in microns, which is basically the smallest unit of measurement that there is. So if there's any variation in that coating trough, it's going to show in the exposure times, it's going to show in ink deposit, all of those things. So throw it away and get a new one. Use fresh emulsion, be consistent. Um, be consistent. Say it pretty much on every slide. It is the key to screen room. Do everything the same all the time. Use both hands for best control. I gotta say I am faulty of this one. I code screens with one hand many, many times. Um, but if you've got a sweet little rack like that, you can actually use two hands. You can have far more control over that coder as you're as you're coding it. Coat slowly to ensure even coverage. 
coat the substrate side first. Always finish on the squeegee side. No matter how many passes, if you're coating it 1 and 24, and if you're coating it 1 and 1 or just 2 and 2, whatever the case is, last pass always needs to come from the squeegee side because it pushes the emulsion through to the bottom side of your screen. And that's the side of the screen that I care about. The top side of the screen, the squeegee side, just holds ink. I don't care about that size. The, the ink guys care about that side of the screen. But from a stencil purpose, all the emulsion needs to be on the bottom side of the screen. That's what's going to create the gasket between what you're printing on and the mesh. If it's vice versa, now you have too thin of a stencil and the ink is going to seep out. It's not going to create a gasket, leaving you nice sharp images. Ice coat in a light safe environment. We've kind of touched on this already. Uh, wet on wet coating technique, you know, like I said, one to two times on the bottom side of your screen, flip it over one to four times on the squeegee side. And then what you want to do is you want to dry your screens flat, squeegee side up. So as the screen is drying, gravity is going to pull that emulsion through to the bottom side of the screen as well. We have leveling agents in the emulsion, which will help if there's any you know, if you have a little bit of variance as you're coating your screens, those leveling agents will help and actually level it out. So it's going to be more consistent and even. So gravity is your friend. You know, flat, squeegee side up. This shows the difference between uh, this slide and the next one will be the round edge, but this shows sharp edge scoop coater. So I don't, on most scoop coaters, not all of them, most of them have a sharp side and a rounded side. So if you're using the sharp side, you can see one pass, two passes, three passes, it still isn't completely even pushed all the way through. Whereas if you're using a dull edge, a rounded edge, one pass, two passes, three passes, you're just putting down more emulsion faster is really what it comes down to. So you can see the difference. So which is better? As long as you're getting the de desired thickness, it doesn't matter. I would say more people in the U.S. will use a rounded edge, but if I'm looking at shops over in Asia, uh, a lot of times, mostly, they'll use the sharp edge. It just comes down to personal preference, but it comes back to maybe with the round edge, you just have to coat your screen one and one. But if you're using a sharp edge, now maybe you have to coat it two and two to get that same that same thickness of emulsion. Really, it only matters what the end result is. You know, how you get to that end result doesn't really matter. It's not going to hurt my feelings one way or another, as long as you're getting to the correct thickness at the end. And if, if you, honestly, if I was coding 100 screens and I could code it one and one versus coding 100 screens two and three, I'm going to choose one and one because now at the end of the day, I'm not as tired, and my screens are going to be far more consistent. As I do more and more screens, the more passes somebody's doing, obviously you're going to get more tired. Or if your screen room guy comes in, he's a little hungover, or whatever the case is, you know, that happens. You know, just try to, you know, the consistency is key. So you just try to do it as easy as possible. So end result is what matters. Tips on drying, kind of touched on this. Dry in total darkness, dry squeegee side up. Do not exceed 110 degrees. So people will have DIY drying cabinets and they put a little space heater in that thing and they crank that thing up and it's like 200 degrees in there and their screens are drying in five minutes. Well, the problem is once you get above that 110 degrees, it starts to kind of bake that emulsion and it's gonna to start to cross like some of those polymers and just start to harden the emulsion. Whereas uh, if you're drying under 110, it's not going to affect it that way. It's just going to dry. Good air movement is better than the heat for drying screens faster. But don't take a fan and blow it directly on those wet screens. I have never seen a clean fan in my entire life. Even, those things are very good at collecting dust and debris. You know, Any fan anywhere you can go run your finger across that thing and there's dust and debris all over your finger. So if you're blowing that, all of your freshly coated screens, it's just blowing all that debris all over your screens. All that 
as a squeegee rubs across that debris and rips it out on press, now you've got a pinhole. So, air movement's good. Fans are great in that room, just tip it away from the screens. Coat today, use tomorrow is best practice. I know everybody's going to have to rush a screen through every once in a while. Try not to do that. If you can coat today, use tomorrow, give the screen enough time to thoroughly dry all the way through, you're going to have a much better stencil. If it's not dry all the way through, I use the analogy, it's like a tomato, right? You can feel the outside, it's dry, you put your finger in the middle, it's wet. That's the same difference with screens that have been drying for 10 minutes. You know, the outside area has skimmed over, but the inside is still wet. And how those polymers that are going to react with water molecules, if you want to get down to the science side of it, um, once you go through the developing process, those water molecules are a broken bond. So it, you won't have, it's going to act like an underexposed screen if the screen still has moisture in that screen when you go to expose it. This talks about shrinkage, not George Costanza, but what the emulsion does as it's drying through that process. So you'll see that it actually will conform to the threads, right? And the thicker the stencil it is, the, the smoother that, that stencil is going to be. So if it's a very thin stencil, you know, you're going to have this really jagged, wavy edge, and that can go back to what your resolution looks like in your print. You know, if it's too thin of a stencil, or if it's too rough of a stencil, it's going to kind of give you like that jaggedy edge, and it's not going to give you nice, smooth, consistent prints that you're after. This is an SEM photo of the same thing. This is just showing those hills and valleys. So uh, an old practice that isn't really used too much today, some graphics printers will still do it, it's called a face coat. So after you were to coat your screens and the screens would dry, you would go back on the substrate side with the sharp edge and just do a pass. And what that pass does is it really doesn't give you more thickness, but it fills in all of those valleys and makes it much smoother. So the more smoother that surface is of that emulsion, that screen is, the cleaner, sharper resolution that you're going to be able to get out of your print. There's some instances where if you're working with like architectural glass, that if it gets too smooth when you're actually printing, it'll create a vacuum and want to suck back up on it. But in textile, you don't have to worry about that. Stencil thickness. So you may have heard the term EOM before. EOM stands for emulsion over mesh. And that's primarily the number one thing that when I go into a screen room, and I'm working with somebody, this is primarily the most important step of the process, other than your exposure times. So I know not everybody has all these fancy tools like I have, right? They're expensive. This, this measurement tool is gauge is right around seven or eight hundred dollars. I don't expect every shop to have that. But if you do, or you have access to one, or you have me or Rob or somebody come in and measure screens for you, we can tell you where you're at. Um, so we're really looking for, and the way that this works is, you've got, what, what you do is you would actually, it pinches between, so you've got this gauge, and you've got a, a metal bar on the bottom side, and you pinch the, the screen between that, and it will measure how thick it is between. So you measure just the mesh alone, and then you measure, you measure the mesh plus emulsion and subtract the two. The difference of those two measurements is your EOM. That's how much the emulsion is actually above the mesh itself. So percent solids. Percent solids is one thing that you'll always hear emulsion manufacturers talk about. What that really is, it's the amount of solids that are suspended in the liquid in the emulsion. So, for example, here, CP Tex is 44% solids, which means it's 56% water. When you coat your screen, that means 
56% of what you put on that screen is going to evaporate away. You're going to only be left with the solids after that screen is dry. So there are much cheaper emulsions out there that are maybe in the low 20s. Keep in mind that to get the same coat between something that's high solids and something's low solids, you have to coat that more passes with something that's lower solids because you have to start with a much thicker stencil because more of that's going to evaporate away during that drying process. So I like to make note of that because people will look at an emulsion and they say, well, this emulsion is $5 less a gallon, so I'm going to use this one, right? However, to get that same stencil, you might only get 30 screens out of a bucket of emulsion with that low solids content emulsion, whereas you can coat one in one with a high solids emulsion and get 80 screens out of that bucket. Now that $5 per gallon that you paid less for that other one is actually costing you $15 more than the other one. What is your uh, Hydro X? Hydro X is four, high 40s. High 40s. Yeah, I think it's 46. I think. Up there. Yeah, I'd have to look at that. I'm pretty sure it's 46. In that range. So 50% solids is about as high as solids that you can put into emulsion and still be able to coat properly. When we talk about the stencil thickness in your emulsion over mesh, the target for industry standard is between 10 and 20% of that overall stencil thickness. So if you measure the mesh plus emulsion, your EOM should be right in that range of 10 to 20%. I like to use like a 110 mesh for my example because 110 mesh is about 110 microns thick, right? So when you coat that, you're looking for your EOM to be somewhere around, you know, 10 or 11 microns up to 22 microns, somewhere in that range. If you're trying to resolve something that's finer detail, you might, you'd have to use a thinner stencil. You can't use a really thick stencil and try to resolve very fine, tiny dots. So keep that in mind as well. This shows the difference between too thin, correct, and too thick stencils. You can see when it's too thin, you get that stair step, jagged, sawtooth looking print because the ink is actually seeping out the edge of where your artwork is. You kind of get the same effect when it's too thick because the ink doesn't fully clear out of the mesh. Because if you think about it, it's like trying to push plastic through a long tube. It's much harder to push plastic through a long tube than say like a like a short wide tuna can, right? You can push it through a lot easier. If you have that perfect 10 to 20 percent, now you can get those perfect sharp edges that you're looking for. Uh, this one shows stencil thickness versus resolution. So the finest detail you should be able to print is going to be twice as wide as your overall stencil thickness. So say this stream, overall stencil thickness is 100 microns. The smallest dot that you should be able to print is 200 microns wide. Now keep in mind, a human hair is about 70 microns, so we're talking pretty small details regardless, but uh, it's just something that I've seen time and time again People are trying to push the limits, they're trying to do these really high line counts, really fine dots, and they, they go, why can't, I, why can't I get this out? They measure their screens, their screens are just too thick for trying to resolve those really fine dots. This shows exactly that. This stencil is too thick to resolve that register mark. It just won't wash all the way through. This also shows the smallest dot you should be able to print based on the mesh count you're using. So the smallest dot needs to cover two threads in a mesh opening. You can see if, if your dot is this big, it's almost the same width as a thread that's going to block all the ink from going through there. You know, common sense tells you it's got to be two threads in a mesh opening to be able to push ink through that. 
Now we'll get into exposure. Uh, so this is going to show on the top here, this is your film positive. The black area is where it's printed. This is going to be blocking the light. Where it's clear, the light is going to pass through it, and it's going to harden that emulsion. Keep in mind, emulsion exposes linearly, so where the light is hitting it first, this side of the screen is going to expose first, and the longer it's in there, it exposes all the way through to the back side. That's why if you feel your screens on the back side, they feel slimy, the color's coming off on your hand, it's telling me that the screen is underexposed. It hasn't had enough time for that light to pass all the way through that screen. Then after it's exposed, you go to wash it out, and the areas that have not been hardened wash away, and that's your image area. So, determining exposure times. A couple different ways you can do it. You can do it with the exposure calculator. This is our exposure calculator. It's a piece of film, and it has a filter tape to it. Each one of those steps filters out a given amount of UV light. So I would take this and I would take an educated guess. Say you think your exposure times are 20 minutes, or not 20 minutes, 20 seconds. I was going to say, there's one that takes that long? Yes, with the, right, with the wrong source, bulk, bulk and everything like that. Yeah, absolutely it does. DIY. Yeah, DIY. Okay. So you take that, you put it on your screen, right? Shoot it for double the time that you expect it to be. Take an educated guess. You think it's 20 seconds. Shoot it for 40 seconds. Now when you go to wash it out, you're going to see, um, you're going to look to see which one of these steps looks the cleanest. Whichever has the sharpest, crispest lines, that's going to be the best, right? So say this middle one right here looks the best as, after you wash it out. There's a little factor right here. 0.5 times what you shot it for, that's your correct exposure time. Does that make sense? It's probably the most important thing that I've said the entire time. Almost. There's another way too. So say you don't have an exposure calculator, you can do a step test. And what a step test is, I know there's a lot of shit going on on this screen, but you've got your stream, and you take a piece of blocking material that blocks, say, like 80% of your stream. You shoot it for a given amount of time, then you move that back. Now you shoot it for that same amount of time. Move it back, so on and so forth. Now this first step that was hit by light first has now been hit six times. So say 10 seconds every single time. Now you're looking, or 30 seconds is what I'm doing here, but say you're doing 10 seconds. Now this has been 60 seconds here, 50, 40, 30, 20, 10 seconds. Now you look at that screen to see, you know, once again, which one of those steps has the best resolution, which one is washing out properly. Also for like a diazo based emulsion, I'm looking for color changes. So it will change color. When it's underexposed, it's going to keep changing color until it doesn't. When it stops changing color, that's telling me that you hit the hardening point of that emulsion. Does that make sense? When I find that hardening point, I typically will add about 10% to just go just, just above it a little bit. Underexposure, like I mentioned before, if you feel the back side and it feels slimy, it's telling me that it's underexposed. So this is shown under exposure, right? The entire back side of this screen has been completely washed away and it doesn't have anything that it's holding on to anymore at that point. Same with these. Fully exposed, you can see the back side is encapsulated by the emulsion. Here you have bare threads, nothing, nothing to hold on to. It's all been washed away because it's underexposed. This is another thing I usually add into here. Um, dyed mesh versus undyed mesh. Most times, you won't see white mesh above, say, like a 156. Most times. You can get it 
but most times you won't. So what ends up happening is when you're using white threads versus yellow dyed threads, the light will go into those white threads and will actually bounce around on the inside of those threads, kind of move through like a, like a fiber optic would. So now it's exposing from the inside and the outside, giving you all kinds of light scatter. Now when you try to resolve something really sharp detail, you're not going to be able to because it's bouncing around. It's kind of, it's going to close in on the edges a little bit. Whereas if you're using dye, it'll actually absorb the light when it goes into those yellow threads, giving you much sharper, cleaner uh, prints. That's why you'll never see like a 230 mesh or a 305 mesh in white. Most times. You're not, you're using those higher mesh counts because you're trying to resolve something finer, something harder. Whereas, um, that's where you want to use those yellow threads for sure. Also keep in mind, say you have a 156 white and a 156 yellow. Exact same, exact same mesh, just one's white, one's yellow. The yellow is going to expose for about two times longer than the white one. Because it's absorbing that. I've mentioned mesh bridging before in some of the other slides. This is what it's talking about. So when you've got good mesh bridging, it's going to not worry. It's not going to be dictated by the threads. You're going to have nice, sharp, clean images, right? So this is telling me that you've got the proper thickness of your stencil, proper exposure time, versus this could be too thin. This could be underexposed, but you can see you're getting that sawtooth thing. another slide, mesh version. Nice crisp clean lines, that's what you're after. This kind of stuff. You can't print this. This just looks cool. After one impression, this is just going to fall right apart. Right? But it just shows what the limits of the emulsion can do. It, it can do more than what you need to do. Good edge definition, you're looking for a nice flat, sharp wall on those edges. The cleaner that is, the sharper that is, the sharper your print's going to be. This is as good as it gets right here. This is our alpha emulsion. This is for the electronics industry. So when I mentioned before, when you're printing your, your phones and everything like that, those touch panels, the smaller you can make those lines, those conductive lines, the smaller, the thinner that you can make that phone or whatever you're trying to, trying to make. So what this is, this is actually 500 mesh, stainless steel mesh. That line right there is a 15 micron line. One red blood cell is 8 microns wide. So. That line that we're resolving is about the width of two red blood cells. Overkill for textile. If any of you are doing this stuff, definitely apply for Golden Squeegee Awards. But uh, overkill for textile. If you're printing on the, the you know, electronic stuff where you're printing gold or platinum paste, you want to have as good of a, a line as you can, but still use as little of the the paste that you can because it's expensive. But yeah, it's, it's just cool. This is the opposite side of the spectrum. This is an emulsion made by one of my competitors. One other way that you can make emulsion cheaper is by using larger particle sizes. But those larger particle sizes now, say you go to print this, your ink is going to get hung up in all those little crevices. So when you go to reclaim that screen and clean the ink out of it, that's going to lead back to ghosting later on. Then you start the cycle of trying to get rid of the ghost images. Put haze remover on there. Caustic, nasty stuff. Yeah, does it get the ink off the threads? It does, but now it starts eating away at those threads and it makes more areas for ink to get hung up in those threads. So the more you use that stuff, the more prone it is to stain. Can't tell us the brand, so to not buy. <laughs> so is the biggest issue with ghosting the fact that using that remover is just going to deteriorate? The that is super nasty. Yeah, I mean it's caustic, yeah. right? It's it's an alkaline paste, which is battery acid. You know, 
So breathing that stuff in, uh, it will also damage your threads. So your your screens aren't going to last as long. You know they're going to they're going to break much faster. But also it's going to promote more staining, more staining, more staining. What's the risk of just not using the page reverb? Well, then you get then you get staining on your screen. And wherever that ghost image was, in a lot of instances, you could actually see that image in your print. Okay. Because that ink, as that ink starts to encapsulate those threads, it makes that thread just a little bit bigger. A little bit bigger. So now, the mesh opening is much smaller in that one spot where that ghost image is. And that's, that's what you can see is basically the ink that's encapsulating that thread. So, when you go to print, now it's laying down less ink right there where that ghost image is. That's why you can actually see that image in the print a lot of times. So this just kind of shows rough stencil, smooth stencil. You can see that the ink is going to flow out underneath it, not giving you a nice, crisp, clean gasket. Same thing, just this is the print results. You can actually see where every thread is on that E on the left. Same thing. We see RZ value. That RZ value stands for the surface smoothness. So the lower that RZ value is closest to zero, tells me it's very smooth. So glass, perfectly smooth, is a zero. The more rough that stencil is, um, would be a higher RZ value. And then we'll get a little bit into film positives. This is where I was going to do a demonstration on the T3270 and print off some film. However, Rob sold the printer last week, and we don't have that printer. Somebody was in a jam and needed a printer fast, so it's on. Anyways, so film positives, image setter silver film is going to be the, the top film that you can get. It's going to be the sharpest resolution, the best D-Max, D-Min possible. So like our exposure calculators, our exposure calculators are that image center film, that silver film. The opposite side of the spectrum, vellum. So vellum is very cheap, right? I mean, you run it through your laser printer, uh, very poor resolution, can lead to a lot of different problems, like registration. As that vellum goes through, it shrinks and expands in that, during that process, but it doesn't do it at the same rate. So when you go to look at all those films, all those films, they don't line up, so your screens don't line up, so when you get to press, it doesn't line up, so then you're pulling your hair out trying to get things to line up, but the problem was your vellums didn't line up to begin with. Also, the clear area of the vellum that light passes through to expose your screen blocks just about as much light as the dark printed area, so you're always underexposing the vellum, no matter what. In between, you've got inkjet film. That's what we manufacture. So nowadays, the inkjet film and the printers have gotten so good that you can do some really killer work, really fine details, as close to the image setter film as possible, uh, but much cheaper. More expensive than vellum, cheaper than image setter. This just kind of shows. So when I talk about D-Max, D-Min, D-Min, is going to be the clear area, the reading of the clear area. D max is the dark printed area. And you want those two readings to be as far apart as possible. So vellum, <coughs> you can see that that gap is pretty narrow, right? It's blocking just as much, as much light in the clear area as the dark area, whereas inkjet film, it's a much wider gap. You can actually expose your screen properly. Vellum versus inkjet. Vellum pros, it's cheap. So yeah. Transparency film. I mean, uh, yeah. stay away from that kind of stuff. Yeah. That's a hot because it's a hot process. Okay. So as it goes through that laser printer, it kind of shrinks and okay. expands like that. Um, so yeah, that transparency stuff as well as the the vellum. I know that there are some vellums that are like a step above, quote unquote, vellum, but it still is in that same ballpark you're still going to run into the same issues. Just not as bad. So on the inkjet kind, do you have to have a, a specific printer? Or does all 
inkjet printers print dark enough? Yes or no. So you can use an inkjet printer and get it to print dark enough. You can use certain, like, we have our third-party inks that go in a lot of the printers, like Epson printers, Canon printers. It's a dye-based ink, which is actually a darker, more opaque ink, versus the pigment-based inks that come with those printers. So pigment-based ink is more transparent. See, it's more transparent by nature. So more light's going to pass through that, whereas the dye-based inks that we have will actually block the light a lot easier. So you can get a much better print with the right film, ink, printer combination instead of just going, well, I've got an inkjet printer. I'll just and regional cells? Yes. Just All the kit? The kit, yep. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, so on the smaller scale, we've got a Canon IX 6820 printer that um, can do 13 by 19 cut sheets. That one, I think, is like 9 70 or something like nine or seventy dollars that comes with the, the printer the film the ink the rip software everything that you need to make good high quality films and then they have the larger printers as well if you want to get more into more industrial film cons like i said it's a hot process they have shrinkage and registration issues not very transparent does not print very dark promotes panels inkjet film Pros is all it's basically everything is just flipped, right? So I mean you're gonna have it's a cold process, so it's very stable, it's very transparent, even though it has like a milky look to it. That milky look is the the coating that we coat on there. It's a microporous coating so that you can put more ink on there. The ink will actually absorb into that microporous coating. That's how you can get nice dark prints. Uh, and you're gonna get you know, you're going to be able to expose your screens properly. They're going to have less pinholes with the inkjet film and belt. Uh, this is that printer package that, that they have. So this is the T3270. So it does, it does up to 24-inch wide rolls of film. Um, much bigger inkjet cartridges, everything that goes along with it. Um, but starting out overkill for, for many years. Then, this is the last section. So common screen problems, right? Washout, breakdown, adhesion loss. You know, your stencil's falling apart on you. It's difficult to wash out. Why won't your image wash out properly? Scumming or haze. What scumming, or ha what scumming is, is that when you wash your screen out, and you see your open area where your artwork is. However, when you go to print it, it seems like something is blocking it. You take like a wet rag and you rub on that and it'll actually open up and then you're good to go. So that's what, that's what scumming is, essentially. Uh, poor image or sawtoothing, uh, that's what I showed before. The edges are not very clean. Undercutting and pinholes. So adhesion loss, right? This is the list of things that basically causes that delamination, adhesion loss, poor coating methods, pre-exposure, outdated film, screen's not dry long enough, like I mentioned before, coat today, use tomorrow, best practice, unless you've got a drying cabinet, a proper drying cabinet. Water temperature is too hot when you're developing your screens. Uh, warm water will help develop your screens easier, but hot water will attack that emulsion as well. Excessive water pressure, you know, there's a wide range of, you know, pressure washers that are out there. I've seen pressure washer that can actually cut through a leather boot. Obviously, that is a little excessive and aggressive, but um, if you're using too much pressure, you can blow out your stencil, especially when it's still wet. Underexposure and then contamination. If it's difficult to wash out when you're developing your screens, it could be that you're, you've got a poor positive light's passing through that dark area of your screen. It's exposing all of the emulsion, not just the areas that you want it to expose. Pre-exposure, your screen got hit by some white light before, uh, before you went to expose it. Outdated emulsion, excessive heat, overexposure, any of those things will cause problems with washing out.
Scouting or haze? Light scatter, pre-exposure. So what scumming is, is the emulsion on the back side of the screen is underexposed. So when you go to wash it out, that water mixes with that underexposed emulsion and then it seeps down into the open area of your screen. When that solidifies and hardens, that, that underexposed emulsion is what's blocking the ink from going through that, that open area of your screen. That's why you can take water in a rag and rub it out and then it'll, it'll be fine. But if you're properly exposed all the way through, you shouldn't have that problem. So poor image, poor positives, undercutting, incorrect drying of emulsion. Steps into thin. Yeah. Exposure, incorrect exposure. Exposure times are, I would say, 90% of the problems that people have. And most of the time, it's underexposure, not overexposure. People are always underexposing because they're like, oh, I've got these half tones I've got to wash out, so I'm just going to cut my exposure back. And eh, wrong. If your your exposure time is your exposure time, it shouldn't vary. If you're trying to resolve something that is too fine for either the the mesh, the stencil combination, what you need to do is go back to the art room and say, we got to make these dots bigger because. Uh, like, we sh like we talked about earlier, the smallest dot needs to be two threads and a mesh opening. And if you really want to take it one step further, fingerprinting your press and doing curves for all of your stuff is the way to go. You would find your proper, proper exposure time, and then what you would do is you would actually print, let's say, little squares that have a 5% patch 10%, 15%, 20%, all the way up to 100. Print that on a shirt, and then you would actually take a meter and measure each one of those squares to see what's actually coming out at the end. So say, say your 5% is actually coming out at 1%, and then you look at your 10% and it's actually coming out at 5%. Well, that's telling me that you have to adjust your artwork to make it actually be 5% is printing 5%. Because your dot itself on the film or in the artwork itself maybe needs to be a 15% dot which actually prints 5% with your stencil. That's how you would actually do those curves. That's taking, that's taking it to the, to the one step. That's taking it to as far as you can go. That's going to be your best case scenario, best prints. Undercutting, the placement of your positive, Light scatter, like white threads, inconsistent exposure, improper exposure, all that good stuff. Pinholes, everybody fights pinholes, right? Clean your shop. A lot of times it's just dirty. You know, dirty glass in your exposure unit. Dust and debris blown on your screens from fans. Like I said, I've never seen a clean fan in my life. If your stencils are too thin, then uh, I, had, I had somebody who, I thought he was in here before, maybe not. Uh, they're just coating one pass on one side of the screen, and they're having pinholing issues. Just too thin of a stencil, you know. Uh, air bubbles in coating, stencils not dry. You know, all of those kind of things are just going to go back to pinholes. All the same stuff everybody finds. Follow me on social media. This is where I conclude. Uh, but yeah, YouTube, Instagram. On my YouTube channel, I've got all kinds of videos. So all the stuff that I talked about in here, I'm actually putting in, you know, doing demonstrations on things. So the exposure calculator, I'm actually doing an exposure oh, cool. calculator test with the, with the film going through it step by step. So in case you don't remember, how I did it. It's, I was going to ask you, but I'll just... I'm more of a visual learner anyways. I wouldn't have learned anything from listening to me talk for the last hour and a half or whatever, but uh, if I see it done and then I do it, that's how I learned. I've got to physically do it. And for me to see it actually happen, then it clicks. Otherwise, uh, it kind of goes in one ear. So, well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.